you as you use me this one more time. For Christ's sake, I pray. Amen. You know, as I, as I think about your theme for Camp Meeting 2022, um, Next Level Mission, Ministry, Mentorship, I couldn't help but look back on the beginning of the New Testament church. I, 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 there's something about the way the church began that literally excites me. Uh, uh, the event, that great event, the greatest event that took place in the history of earth, the coming of Jesus Christ into a world of sin and degradation to live and to die for lost humanity. And just before Jesus ascended back to his father, the Bible tells me that he gathered his disciples and he entrusted to them, I would say, the future of the church. Now, when I look at these men, when I look at them, I could not help but think, how could Jesus entrust the future of his church to these men, uneducated, unfit, faithless in so many ways, by by their very nature, the mission to me was doomed to failure even before they started. But then the Bible tells me in Acts chapter 2 that as they gathered in the upper room, the Spirit of God was poured out on them and they came forth from that room with power. The Bible testifies that thousands were converted, demons were expelled and paganism was challenged and the sick were healed and without education, they astonished and defied and confused learned leaders and teachers of the law without military training. Someone said they were mightier than the army of Rome. Are you listening to me this morning? The New Testament church of God came forth. Someone said it was born in power. It moved in power. It grew and was nursed in power. It ministered in power. The Bible testifying Acts chapter 2 43. Many wonders and signs were done through these same uneducated and common men. As a matter of fact, it is Mark 16 that tells me in verse 20, they went out and they preached everywhere. Hallelujah. They did not just stay in their settled, comfortable spot. They went and they preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by signs and that accompanied it. The church was unstoppable. It was a force to be reckoned with. And then I thought about our theme. And I looked at the church today. And I'm convinced something is amiss. Something is wrong. In her book, Early Writings, E. White stated, if the church had always retained her holy and peculiar character, the power of the spirit, which was imparted to the disciples, if they had retained the power of the Holy Spirit, if the church, that word if bothers me, because it tells me that the church has not retained her holy and peculiar character. For if the church had, she said the sick would be healed, devils would be rebuked and cast out, and she would be a mighty and a terror to her enemies. Today I look at the church, and the church seems to be afraid of the world. I couldn't help but think that maybe, just maybe, the text we find that we've studied so often and we think it's not about us, that maybe, just maybe, Revelation chapter 3, 1 through 6, may very well be true of the church today. 
And all we often thought, Laodicea, the heart, the cold, the in-between. But when I look at God's church and I sense God's people, I realize that it could be that Revelation 3, 1 through 6, and I'm just going to quickly read it, to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. It goes on, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come. And I will read the next verses later today because this message is going to transition in the afternoon service. Are you with me? So I'll pick that up. But, but, but listen, listen, listen. The Bible looks at the text. The text rather tells us Jesus comes to the church and, 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 and he said when you look at, I think it was in a, a verse, verse 5 it, it tells us that somewhere there, there are some in the church who have not defiled their garments but literally the verdict remains, the church is dead. The words of Jesus, you know, I, I thought about this, uh, and I often hear our young people say, Pastor, the churches are dead. I don't like going to church anymore because the churches are dead. And in their mind or their concept of dead church uh, is that the church lacks music uh, and the church lacks entertainment uh, and the church lacks, you know, a well-planned program. But Jesus looks at it in the opposite direction. You see, I believe that Sardis was a powerful church with well-planned programs and great religious activities. I believe that they were correcting their doctrines and they had great worship service. Somebody ought to say amen. Yet the heart searcher, the one who sees not as man seeth, look at the church. He doesn't see that the church is dead because of its music. He doesn't see that the church is dead because of religious activity. The church was filled with music, filled with religious activities, moving in well-planned programs, great worship service, but the searcher of the heart of men looked at his church and said, you're dead. Ah, oh, dead preachers in pulpits preaching dead sermons to dead people in the pews. Dead. I'm talking what I want to talk or saying something to try to get you discouraged. I just want to represent the word to you this morning. As he laid it in my spirit, the church was not accused of being doctrinally incorrect, of being immoral or bad. The church was accused of being dead. It's not a matter of being bad or good. It's a matter of dead or alive. The church is not alive. The church is dead, and I ain't talking about dead in the physical existence or activities, but dead in its spiritual vitality and genuine fruitfulness. When you look at verse 2, the Bible said, Jesus declare, I have not found your works perfect. I look the word works and I realize, I realize, I realize uh, it's the same word he used in Mark chapter 13, 34 when he tells the parable of the man taking a far journey. He said, for the son of man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants uh, and to every man, every man, to every man he gave his work. Uh, the man is going on a far journey. He is leaving and he left his servants in charge and he gave every man can I tell the church something that there is not one of us who are baptized member of this seven day Adventist church who has an excuse not to be a worker in the kingdom of God your business here has nothing to do with you making a living your business here has nothing to do with you making or getting a good education getting your doctorate it's all good I got mine it's all good but that 
that's not our business here. The church exists for just one reason, and that is the work of the kingdom of God, the building up of the kingdom of God. Oh, we have spent our days. We have spent our days caring about the things of earth, the jobs, <laughs> the education, the house, the family, all good things. But the sole existence for this Seventh Day Adventist Church is your building of the kingdom of God, the mission of God's kingdom. For this purpose alone, the church exists. And so for Jesus to pronounce the church dead, for me, that's problematic. Because the church, the called out ones, by its very essence, has to do with life. The church is built on Jesus, who is the resurrection and life. John 10.10, 10, he declares, I am come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Therefore, for the church to be dead uh, simple means that the life giver is not in the church. In her novel, Wise Blood, Flannery O'Connor talked about the preacher who preaches a church without Christ, where nobody sheds blood, no redemption, cause ain't no sin to redeem, and what's dead stays dead. A church without Christ is what Sardis was. And I fear, I fear today that our church is becoming and may have become mm, a church without Christ. Christ was not in the church and the church did not know it. It reminds me of Samson when in the dark days of Israel's history, when God raised him up as a great champion of deliverance for his people, but through careless complacency, he was defiled or, or beguiled by Delilah. And, and, and when confronted with danger, he tried to escape just like he always did times before. But the Bible chronicled uh, these uh, sad words. He knew not that the Lord had departed from him. I fear today, I fear today that the words of Carl Bart, uh, uh, Bates, rather Carl Bates, uh, uh, may be correct in so many ways if God were to take the Holy Spirit uh, out of our midst today, uh, about 95% of what we do in our churches uh, would go on and we would not know the difference. Uh, this seems to be the reality of so, man, so many of our church today, the reality of God's church, not many, one church, uh, God's church today, though many would scoff at the suggestions that the church is dead. The inhabitor of eternity looks at the church and said, I know you think you are alive. I know with all your great programs, you think everything is okay. But I look at you and I realize that your work, you are dead rather. Your work is unfinished. It's imperfect. It's incomplete before God. He looks at his church and he said, something is wrong. The life that the church ought to have he isn't there. What is that life? What gives the church life? The power of Jesus Christ. How does the church remain alive? To carry forward the work that it was developed or established to do. George Orwell once says, 
He tells a story of a trick he played in a wasp sometime. As he started having breakfast one morning, a wasp was sucking jam on his plate. He cut the insect in half. The insect paid no attention, merely went on sucking the jam, while a tiny stream of jam trickled out of his severed esophagus. Only when he tried to fly away did, the, did he realize, the insect realize the dreadful thing that had happened to him and I, I look at the church and I wonder and I wonder it could it be could it be could it be that, that, that we are like this insect that, that we have become busy uh, with our earthly pursuits uh, uh, sucking on the jam of the world and, and, and while we are doing so uh, while we are gathering uh, all the earthly blessings and uh, the earthly material things uh, while we are sucking uh, on the jam of the world uh, the enemy has somehow been busy cutting us apart, uh, severing us uh, from the source of life uh, and, and we are so totally indifferent uh, to, to, to our spiritual state uh, unaware that we have lost our spiritual power and our zeal for God and we continue with ministry as though nothing is gone wrong or has gone wrong and somehow deep inside of us, many of us know that something is wrong. Many of us know that the power of God's Spirit is not with us. Pastors and people alike know deep within them that something is wrong. But to stay alive, we substitute programs for power. Social reform for spiritual reform. We are very busy becoming culturally relevant. Mm? Use a friendly church, technologically savvy, advocates of social justice. The church is always trying to follow the latest trend of the world, the latest fashion, always reinventing ourselves to match with the times, our desire to be the church of the 24th century that is successful, effective, and well alike has caused the church to mirror the world in so many ways. You can already differentiate between the world and the church these days. We have mastered the Art of preaching Christ crucified in such a way as not to offend the world. We have managed to refashion the gospel of Jesus so that it makes good sense to the degenerate mind. And then we call it contemporary gospel. And this contemporary gospel has produced contemporary Christianity, a kind of Christianity that calls for no personal sacrifice produces virtually no separation from the world and breeds practically no hatred for sin contemporary gospel the conventionality of the contemporary church has trapped us in a cultural captivity where our doctrine has been disregarded discounted, distorted dismissed, simply dissed by church and world by the very habits and the rituals of our daily lifestyle. We are absorbed in a culture that is tearing God's church apart and we call it contemporary. I see my time is going. The church the church, this church that was once offensive to the world's way of living has managed to become the model of inoffensive Christianity. One of the greatest signs of our deadness is that there is no longer anything unique or mysterious about the church are the God of the church. There's very little about this church. <laughs> 
There's very little about this church, uh, this uh, Seventh-day Adventist church, uh, that cannot uh, be found in any other denomination uh, and could not be satisfied uh, by any number of secular programs uh, and self-help groups. Uh, everything about God's church uh, can now be explained uh, by the secular world, uh, whether by psychology or by stati statistics. Uh, can I take your mind back uh, to the days of the apostle, the Bible tells tells me in the fifth chapter of Acts uh, that in those early days uh, when the church met together on Solomon's porch uh, so great uh, was the presence of God uh, that the world uh, dare not to draw close to them uh, I somebody I thought about Moses uh, when he heard uh, and felt the presence of God uh, at the burning bush uh, he took off his shoes uh, for the place in which he stood uh, was holy because of the presence of God I thought about Isaiah when he went into the temple the Bible said uh, he saw the presence of God and he cried out whoa it's me uh, somebody <laughs> they saw fire and smoke and they stood back. But today, <laughs> today, the world come as close as they please, for no one is afraid of ashes. But the fire has gone out of the church. You have a name, you have a name. You have a great reputation. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. The church lost sight of its purpose for existence. Our work has become earthly focus because we have forgotten that we were made for eternity. Unfinished business in the sight of God. Unfinished business in the sight of God. The Bible is clear. I'm going to end because I'm going to pick this up later. The Bible is clear that it's not you, your religious activities, not your well-planned programs, not your well-oiled machine of technology, all of this is great and powerful, but there is a mission. Dead because there is unfinished business. The church has not been paying attention to the business for which it was established. The church has become dependent on men, money and programs to run the mission. The mission of God will only be accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's not the pastor's job, it is everybody's job to be a missionary. And you don't have to travel to some foreign country to be a missionary. I am a missionary right where I am. It is my duty once I am called by the name of God to be a soul winner, to be a proclaimer by the gospel of the gospel of Jesus. I live it by my life and I proclaim it with my lips. It is my duty. It is our duty as well as pastors together to proclaim this great gospel in a world where humanity sanctions every far island indulgence but the church is sucked into itself paying attention to itself we go to our jobs we go to our schools we take care of our business and the money that God has entrusted to us for his business is spent on ourselves give some missionary offering you can barely give an offering you come to church and you give barely your one dollar in the no 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 your one hundred dollar bill that can to do nothing. I'm going to end with this story. I'm going to pick this back up. 
there was a pastor who went to his church for prayer meeting. And the attendance was usually small, but on this particular evening, no one showed up. Even the deacon who went to open the church left. And after waiting for about 30 minutes for his members to put in his, their parents and realize that they weren't coming, he was the only worshiper. He went to the bell tower and slowly told of the bell as the custom was when someone died in the town. The alarm was magnetic. It went all over. And all over the town, the inquiry was made, who is dead? A member, a number of his members rushed to the church to find out who was the unfortunate one. Just then the minister descending the steps from the bell tower was interrogated, interrogated by several of the members. Who is dead pastor? The church is dead was his response. And he resigned his pastorate. But I thank God, I thank God right here for this is where Jesus should have resigned. <laughs> But Jesus says, wake up. <laughs> I thank God that Jesus did not resign when he looked at the church and saw that it was dead. Instead, he appealed to the church to wake up. The one who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, the great life giver, hallelujah, comes to the dead church as the one who is the resurrection and the life and said, dead church, wake up. You see, the cry of the heart of God this morning is for the church to wake up, wake up out of our spiritual slumber, wake up out of our spiritual laziness, wake up out of our spiritual slutfulness, wake up out of our spiritual indifference. We ought to wake up. Would to God the church would cry this morning, breathe on me breath of God, fill me with life anew that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou do. Breathe on me, O breath of God, until my heart is pure, until with thee I will one be, to thee to do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine, until this earthly part of mine glows with fire divine. Would to God somebody would stand up and shout, breathe on me, O breath of God, so I shall constant be and live with thee the perfect life of thine eternity. Somebody needs to cry out, breathe on me, O breath of God, that I may live, that I may do the work that you assigned me to do. Somebody need to shout, breathe on me, O breath of God, that I may be committed, that I may be dedicated, that I may be steadfast, that I may be unmovable to do the work that you have assigned me to do. Breathe on me, O oh breath of God, that the mission, the mission of West Jamaica Conference would not remain unfinished, but when he looks at our mission, he will say, you have done the work that I've assigned you to do. Breathe on me. Stand with me. God, only you know, only you know, while there are a few, it may be that the majority of us are dead. Good programs, good worship service, good music, but dead. 
Breathe on us, Jesus. Breathe on West Jamaica Conference, O oh God Almighty. Fill us with life anew. Make us to do the things that you've assigned us to do. To love as you love. Serve as you serve. Breathe on us, O oh God Almighty. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat>